Assalamu alaikum everyone, uh, welcome to Media and Politics. Today it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, Sayyid Muzammil, who is a mainstream journalist. He is, he is currently an actor with Capital TV, but I believe that he's worked for at least five different channels in the last seven or so odd years, including GNN, your favorite channel, Neo TV, yes. Channel 5. And in addition to his mainstream work as a as a news anchor and as an anchor in general, uh, his social media channel in fact is hugely, hugely popular. When I greeted him today, I called him the king of criticism <laughs> because that's what he loves. Um, honestly, in the last seven years, uh, he didn't really come to my attention until I apologize. But until I came across this uh, this uh, uh, Facebook uh, vlog in which this obviously mainstream journal was just trashing celebrities. <laughs> I mean, I thought to myself, this guy must have a, uh, some sort of a career suicide wish or something. He must want to destroy his career because every other media person is always saying, Salah, I'm going to get into Mahira Khan is so amazing. And Sham Shahid, aside from his bad lighting, is so good looking. You know, but all this amazing celebrity want to be closer to them because if you're closer to the celebrity, maybe some of their sunshine and starlight and you know will, will also shine on you. Anyway, Muzammir was like, these people are absolutely useless. Why do we even listen to them? Why are they always on the media? And why aren't we listening to people who are more intelligent and better read and better educated? And I was like, ah! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like this guy already. <laughs> anyway, it was, a, it was a fascinating vlog. And so I began to follow him more and more and listen to his uh, vlogs. And the, one of the things that struck me immediately was Christopher Hitchens sitting in the background in an image. And I was like, oh my god, he is really Christopher Hitchens. And then I looked next to it, there's a man with a big moustache, and that is none other than Frederick Nietzsche. And uh, later I discovered. That Muzamil's uh, quotes, uh, Nietzsche and Heidegger and Anne Ryan and maybe also Christopher Hitchens, but I missed that, etc. And it led me to feel very fascinated that somebody could be quoting Nietzsche who has not, in fact, studied Nietzsche from one. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, but I think it, there's one thing that describes his, um, his video logs in particular it is the constant call to seek rationality and to seek a culture that is based on serious engagement and critical thinking. And though I may on occasion disagree with Muzammil, as I'm sure he disagrees with me as well, but that I think is quite unique. And what is more unique in that is the phenomenal response he has received despite being unabashedly outspoken and in your face belief. And I'll be honest with you. Yeah, even I self censor. Okay, I put things a little diplomatically, mm -hmm. go to a little bit of fairs here, a little bit of jalit there, and so on. Right? But Mozambique thinks, throws caution at the winds and basically lets it all hang out. So, so I thought we should get a, uh, a personal conversation with uh, someone who I think is a very bright upcoming journalist who's already made a mark for himself with a brief time that he's had. On, uh, in mainstream media as well as in social media. And I have no doubt that he has a very powerful career in television. And I just wanted to catch him early before he becomes so big that he'll be like, what can we do? Love is what is that? <laughs> so I thought, you know, catch them when they're early, right? So here we are. Muzalda, welcome to Lance. Thanks. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks a lot, staying here. And you made me sound like the last time I saw you. I'm just too bad stuff. Yes, <laughs> well, to some extent. Yeah. You know, but somebody who I used to look up to would still do that. Philosophy lecture that we really in my earliest memory, you know, I was astounded that somebody's talking on the national television about philosophy. Oh, you talking about me? I was just uh, you know, amazed to see that, you know, just to be here in the same room with him as an honor. Thanks a lot for inviting me. You're too kind. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty of the Marvel. So, we have been looking at various media theories. We will look at the news, how it's constructed, how it's created. And what we want to try and understand today is we read various international authors, Noam Chomsky, Herman, many others, etc., McLuhan, and so on. And of course, that's an international author. But we want to be able to 
rooted to ground in Pakistan. The first thing that I want to ask you, how is the news selected, constructed? What is the process through which news actually in Pakistan is, becomes news? First of all, there is you know, this massive confirmity, there is a bad bagging culture inside the media customers because there is a benchmark which is mostly geo news And everybody is looking up to that, but what they are running has to be on our screen at the same time. Because otherwise, they will snatch us from the ratings. The DRP is the most important factor. So that's why if there is something on the television screen of geo TV and you're not showing it at the same time, you are losing traction. So you have to catch up. So firstly, there's a culture of bad value and that that's random selection because you don't have to pay for yourself. You just have to switch on to the main channel and just follow the course. And secondly, there's an assignment desk in every organization, which assigns the models to specific duties and stories at the start of the day. So they just say hey, these are the three, four important stories in the city, and that's what you have to see for it. That's your assignment. So they'll go up and they'll, they'll hunt for that, they'll make a package or a report or a live paper. They have, they have a satellite line alongside them, which helps them in broadcasting from outside from anywhere. And who makes this decision? Are these the five names? Well, the assignment editor does that because uh, they kind of, you know, uh, they can choose from the stories and the three, four stories are there. So if the highlight is the highlight of the days has been chosen at, at the earliest of the days, and the reporters who are going out will have to focus on the assignment only. It's not like they're just walking down the road and they see something happen and they are broadcast right. at home. Right. They are already there with a the mindset right. that this is what we are here to find. And is it a bias in that process? Well, it's completely biased because there is no objectivity in reporting. If I'm a reporter, I've been out there with the mic as well. So if I want to get an opinion about, uh, let's say, inflation or about the high in petrol prices. So I will ask any one of you to comment about it and I'll you know, just put the mic in front of you. You'll say, hey, what my guy is going or or how much is going to be done. So I'll just tell that specific part of the conversation. If somebody says, I'm satisfied, I have enough money, I won't tell that. I'm the gatekeeper. So the, report, the reporters are actually the gatekeepers of the story. And they decide what is true and what is false. Mm -hmm. So it's totally up to them. Whatever direction they want to run it into, they can do that because they're the masters. Of it. Is there an effort to fit these uh, these sort of uh, various stories, whether inflation pay hai or unemployment pay hai, inside some sort of master narrative? Is there a master narrative that the media is being directed to? Well, there is one because it depends on the organization you're working with. And all organizations seem to have their own loyalties as well because it depends on who is leading the organization, what are their interests as well. So basically, these are all uh, industries that are making money. It's not just an objective news industry, which is after the pursuit of truth and all that. That's all you know, we have been fed into inside the academic spaces, but that's not our job. It's happening in the technical realm. They you. Yeah. So, these businessmen, you know, they will hunt for things which enhances their, should I say, self-respect. Because that is, is something which is the backbone of their, their entire problem of the news industry. Because almost, if there are 10 channels in, in the city of Lahore, 8 of them are owned by businessmen who are like tycoons in their own field. Somebody has an airline, somebody has uh, this bakery chain, somebody has uh, the, the chains of school and education sector and all that. So they would like to side with the narratives that could help them in enhancing their profits. Otherwise, if they antagonize the state altogether, if they antagonize people who are worthy, you know, who can help them in getting more money and all that, so they will get into trouble. They will suffer. They will want to suffer. So that's why they'll side with their own kind of zones. And for that, they can angle any story whatsoever. We have seen how AIY has been doing that in the past. Breaking news Shazi and Ram Khan ki kush khabari hai wahan pe. Aur jab badhata hai to dasar pe badhata hai to uspe they won't kind of run it. So it is, it is decided, uh, it is pre-decided as well. Okay, this is what we are going to bash today. Absolutely. All day in our screens. Absolutely. Whatever we flash in terms of breaking news, we'll go after these people and these narratives. And this is what we need to construct our own. So this is how they choose it. And uh, obviously most of the time it's very obscurantist in nature. You don't really know what is happening. Even the people in the organization, 90% of the people have no idea that the, how it is being decided. So even the news anchors, you know, who are reading the script uh, at 
that particular mode. If I'm reading a script, because there's a teleprompter in front of the reactor, this is the question that we have been asked almost all the times when we go out. So what we do is we read the script actually most of the times, 80% of the times. Unless there is a breaking news, some attack somewhere, or you know, somebody visiting some something, that's another issue. But when we are reading the script, we don't know how it is being made and what are the agendas behind it. So you're not sending the script at all? Not at all. We are just sitting there like robots, you know, just consuming that information and housing that on it. So we don't know the nitty gritties and the complexities of how it is being made, what is being projected. Our entire stress is on you know, delivering that script smoothly without doing any fumbles and all that. So that's why I say that 90% of the news anchors, news anchor and program anchoring is by the way different, just to clarify that. Because news anchor is somebody who would deliver bulletins. A bulletin is, a, a bulletin is happening every week, you know, after every couple of hours. Like there's a bulletin at 8 a.m. and then there's one at 10 a.m. And there is one at 12 a.m. then 3 p.m. So it goes on the entire day and night as well. So once I was asked by one of my professors, how do how do you gather so much content that you're out there broadcasting it every single hour? This is so strange. Just that much of things are happening in Pakistan. So I just say that we repeat almost 80 percent of that because we have to. And that's why we have been mocked as well. Because whenever we go out in public, people say, تو <laughs> What are you going to say? Because it's just one sentence. The Prime Minister has reached the parliament, that's it. The story is over. So how do you cover the screen? You keep repeating that, you keep rephrasing that, and you look stupid while you do it. Because it's evident that you would do it, you will look stupid because you're saying the same thing again and again. So this is why this particular medium, which Marshall McLuhan also said, the medium is the message, right? So the medium makes you an idiot. Because you have to introduce so much fillers to a sentence. That the fillers are meaningless by the way, they are just words in the air, they don't mean anything. This is one reason I don't watch the news. I mean, I prefer to be. But uh, is there a hierarchy of credibility to be read about this? These are the sources that are legitimate, and these are just sort of, you know, we're not going to rely on these sources. Is that the case in Pakistan? Well, is it about personalities or are you asking about sources? Sources, as in we have, you know, the state. It's going to put out a yeah. point of view, then we have political parties, yeah. then we have uh, other institutions, then we think tanks, etc. So, is there some sort of in the media? Is there something we can do here? This is the last thing. But if we can do here, then we can ignore it. Well, first of all, the first thing which is valued is, is that you said that you are not here. So, if it's coming from the institutions, then it's almost coming from. Or from a scripture, right. which you can't even change, you can't even try to do it. So I remember this instance was one, one time I was the script of this very source that I'm talking about, and I just added one or two words by my own thinking. I just added one or two words by my own self. So I got a call from the newsroom and they saw me inside and said, I don't know what happened. So I appeared in front of my boss and he said that you just added two more words to this. Why did you do that? So I said this, I was just about to you know, complete the sentence and just to connect it in a better way. I just added another juncture. It was a grammatical thing. Yeah. So he said, no, you're not supposed to do that. Because these are the script you're not supposed to touch. They should go on here as you see without any addition or any sort of that subtraction. So that's the one part of the story that if they are coming from that source, you know, which is the only source. So you can't amend that because that, that would be a journalistic blasphemy, number one. Number two is, uh, you know, the credibility that you talk about is about the personalities as well. There are some personalities who kind of attract more traction or more ratings, more DRPs. For instance, somebody like Shane Rishi or Fayaz Rasul Johan, or like Shabazz Gil, because these all people belong to the entertainment class of politicians. 
So the the, the I don't really even know back. <laughs> so the purpose of media is to entertain, not to inform at all, because uh, there is this very important thing that we post. I don't know whether you have to talk about it or not. But it's somebody you can't miss when you talk about media industry, specifically the broadcast industry. So he says that the function of media is to gather an audience and sell it to an advertiser. That's you know, which I also get into the other part. So if you have to gather an audience, you have to entertain on You can't just cram them and fly information and make them see. So this is why there would be a rise of entertainers on the television screen. Yeah, because the audiovisual entertainment, uh, how, how, how the, the system works actually, is the system, is the medium of entertainment. Because the language takes the back seat on the television screen. That's why if you go to these executive offices in the media industry, the office of the CEO, of the editor, of the news head, all of the television are put on a mute, your remote. They are not even listening what my angle is saying. They are just looking at the screen, what the graphics are there, and uh, what is the footage being aired, uh, who are. So the 90% of the stress is on the footage which is being on here. So they are giving you know, the entire importance and the stress on the image which is running on here. So the language actually took the back seat, whatever you say of the television screen is not important. What makes these particular individuals, as you put it, what is it that they do that raises the TRP rating, which we should discuss in that film? What, what is it about them that they, that people like? Can you just help us understand that? Well, they are polemical. But they, what they do is polemics 99% of the time. Because if you're asking for, for the opinion of Sheikh Rashid or Fayyad or Sanchohan or Shahbaz, they would add these anecdotes to their talks. They would, they would, they would speak in a, uh, in a very unparliamentary manner. They would use language which is very sensational. Even the anchors do that because the purpose is to entertain a For instance, if I'm about to say hey, five people have died because of COVID-19, so the script will put go like, Paanch Afraad Coronavirus Ki Vajah Se Baan Ki Wali Majal. This is how they write it. I think mean, this is so, this, this looks like a, Suspense novel or something. It's a sensational. Yeah, it's a sensational. I mean, I have never said this to anyone. I have never said this to anyone. But they will make me say that on a television screen because they want it to be projected at, in a style of a TV kind of a, a drama. Yeah, infotainment. Which is an absurd term. Contradiction in terms of informa information plus entertainment. I don't know how that happens. So, the language which could be used on that medium is just has to be entertainment oriented. Mm -hmm. That's why the politicians who would invoke that entertainment in the masses would take the front seat and parties are going to hand them the power. This is very surprising for me because I thought the reason why people like Shabazz, Gil and others etc. are there is because their parties send them. But you're saying as actually process people. This is the other way around because the more attention that they are gathering, the more in you know, that, that's where, that is defining their importance. That is why they will always choose people who can say these things very shamelessly, mm -hmm. who can bash anyone without any manners or whatsoever, and who can kind of create uh, this poetic sort of uh, terminology or share this language, iske alawa, mazak bhi karenge, below the bad arguments bhi karenge. They are demagogues. Yes, they are. So, some of the readers are demagogues. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is how they pick and choose these people. And even the religious clerics which are preferred to come on here are those people who don't talk about the theological aspects of religion. They are just people who just want to you know, kind of make the most of the emotional invigoration in, in, in a person to be so around. So that's why even when religion is discussed and politics is discussed, it's really just the most superficial aspect of discussion on the television screen because nothing else can happen about the post man on a TV screen. You mentioned in your talk this thing called TRP rating. Can you firstly explain what TRP stands for and what is it? Well, basically, there is a company named Media Logics and they have this kind of a network which is very, again, I'll say, which is very Oscar in nature because we don't know how they are gathering this data. So they are going to, you know, monitor some, some channels and some broadcasts according to their own. Monitors which they installed in some mainstream cities like Islamabad or Karachi. What is this monitor that you install? Well, it's like 30, I believe it's like uh, if you persistently 
watch a channel for more than 30 seconds, you get one trade. Yeah, but it's all speculation. There's nothing confirmed about the process of trading because they don't kind of make it out. They don't put their methodology. No. At least I haven't come across that. So that's how we calculate that. In terms of you know the ratings and all that calculations, that's where you get the advertisements because if you can show that yeah, you mean a show, art was a lot or a skinny rating. So according to that, I will negotiate with the advertising. And uh, advertisement is all about television, and television is all about advertisements because if you're watching the advertisement and you, you're not paying for it to watch the broadcast, you are the product capture, which they are selling. Because they are showing your attention to those advertisers that look, this is the number that we have, not talk to us. So you are being sold there. And even Postman mentioned that in his work as well. That, a, that a, an American citizen who's 40 years old has watched on average one million advertisements on the value of in a lifetime. Five years or 40 years. And that was the calculation of uh, 1985. Now it must be around four million. Because social media is there, YouTube is there as well. So this is what it does to our psychology. That it breaks us down to, to very empty and very simple solutions of complex problems. Because in, in the advertisement, it is encompassing on 30 seconds. You know, a child does just come back on the after the match. He will go to his mom and say, there are a couple of people who have to get a little problem solved. So politics key psychology will come down. Because we want simple solutions under 30 seconds to very complex problems. So this is how you know, we, are, uh, we go about these things. And even in the media industry, the anchors use this terminology as well. The way we have started and now is so now this factor is very interesting. We also say that we have many cover for you. A much savant to be in the other five or one of the chases out of our cover country. The next moment after narrating that uh, kind of a catastrophic event, I'll say, Abani Bani will have to bank in Paris fashion, Paris fashion media, the main collection of the Paris fashion models, ramp up on the German beginning. So the next second. I have made the event become, uh, you know, make, make it look like <laughs> very, very, very non serious. That I have just made it go absolutely in a non serious manner. I mean, five to six people have died. And the next second, I am saying, ki aage or after the When I say, aage I am breaking your train of thought. So, the purpose of a sentence was to consistently think and talk about an assertion. But, but we use is to disconnect sentences, is to disconnect the train of thought, so that the listener or the viewer goes to the next story. And it's, a, it's in our hands that we die. Very interesting. So, what you're saying is that, in fact, the way the English language is structured, yeah. given its ownership pattern as well as its uh, need for advertising, versus the fact that it's actually not the product they're selling, but it's the consumer that they're selling to yeah, the advertiser, yeah. uh, creates for a kind of programming that actually militates against and contradicts continuous being caught inside the front gates. It cuts it up into little, little, little pieces of confetti. So that no real, you know, sort of sustainable conclusion can be reached at all. Exactly. Yeah, because if I'm doing a program which is it's a one hour slot from 8 to 9 p.m., which I do as well. So the, the airtime that I'm provided by the MCR, which is the master control room, because my producer would go to the MCR before the program and they'd ask it. Ask him my time at my house. So he'll check the advertisement chunk and he will tell us that the max you have is 32 minutes. In 32 minutes, I have to talk about economy and politics and the law and order situation with three guests on the panel. So almost 8 to 10 minutes are my introduction and my question. What's left is only 18 minutes for three guests to talk about economy, politics, and law and order. Six minutes each. That is absurd. Because it is like mocking an entire nation of 20 million people to make them believe that we are about to say something very meaningful under six minutes each. Mm -hmm. So I quoted that as well that uh, the Lincoln Douglas debates in the American presidency in the 19th century. On average, one debate was seven hours. Seven hours for one debate in American audiences used to listen to most people that this is their agenda, they are running for the office. What is your policy on education, on sciences? on informed policy and all that. So that was the attention span back in the 19th century. 
now it has come down to a catastrophe here. It has hit in the wrong bottom. That we all we the most that we have to talk about an issue on the PPC is five or on maximum six months. So what, what you can do in, in that particular time is just generation very very superficial kind of activities and development. We, we studied this when we looked at concision as one of the key ways through which ideas can be disciplined. So look, you've actually uh, touched upon many of the uh, five filters that we looked at. We looked at ownership, advertising, official sources. Uh, Flat, you mentioned briefly how journalists are, are disciplined, that they brought into the newsroom and you know, told why two and two words. It was not for you to add. What about um, the idea we also studied that there is a tendency in the mainstream media to create this other, and the other is this mortal enemy that is an existential threat to your society. Um, for the Americans, it was the Cold War and the evil empire of the Soviet Union. Um, for uh, others, it may be other things. What is it for Pakistan, and does that really have an impact in Pakistan on our news? And information Well, you also entered into the Cold War era, which is, I mean, the American media used McCarthy you know, for, for their broadcasting policies as well, which is very scary actually because they, want, they wanted American audiences to get absolutely scared of the rise of communism in the Western hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So they tried their best of you know, kind of spreading that paranoia among the masses. Mm -hmm. This is what we do as well because we project. Uh, Let's say the young ones. Uh, it happened quite recently, even after a cricket match, there was this wave of Afghanophobia in the entire country. Where even any Pashtun nowadays, you know, walking on the road was abused and harassed by these people who say they are the genetic mutia by the young. The young said, that you can keep me apart. So I also talked about that in one of my series as well, you know, how does it affect us? So, you know, this projection, the, even in the media industry, I, I have an example. When I was uh, working for a channel three years ago, I was there to read a script which was about uh, the Baloch uh, students uh, in Punjab University. And it went like Balochistan ke talabar ke to scholarships de ke yaan padhaan ke liye kubadi hai. Ho yaan aapke rea riyasi se kar ke kubadi So I said, I just went to the newsroom and I said, do you have an idea for your bottom? You're about to disenfranchise an entire community of people. Just by saying that all the Roche people who come to the hall to study indulge in anti state activities. Do you know what that could do as per the treatment of that community? So they, they say that this is an only thing that could So they didn't. No. Was, yeah, because the, the reason is that the Pakistani media and its definition of Pakistan is three cities. Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad. Whatever happens outside the premises of those three cities is totally insignificant. Yeah. Even when very important uh, kind of uh, events took place, the war in Balochistan, or what's happening in Fatah, or what Taliban are doing to school girls in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. it's totally insignificant. Mm -hmm. So they would put stress upon anything which is happening in Lahore, like a match in the Rabi Stadium. So the, the theory is to engage bigger audiences. And all the bigger audiences they exist in mainstream cities. Karachi has the highest population. So even there is this cattle kind of you know, going down a train in Karachi, it would be a breaking news. Mm -hmm. But if five, six people died in Pata or Pulochistan, it's not worth it. Okay. Yeah, because it won't attract the audience. When I was growing up, the you know the big other for Pakistan only is the India. Yeah, it still is. Sorry, I missed it. <laughs> Uh, so that's what I wanted to ask. Is that still the case? Well, it's still the case because uh, I think it, it, is, it has reason the bit in the recent past. But uh, I remember doing this last mission of uh, the Abhinandan plane crash. And it was very chicoistic in nature. Because we literally have to convert ourselves into mainstream soldiers. <laughs> so this female moderator who's sitting next to me is saying, Bharati uh, pilot mo Pakistani job Send them to hell instead of me. So, and I, I was very, you know, very disappointed in being a part of that transmission because a person sitting next to me is saying xenophobic kind of 
revolutionary work, and I'm also sharing this with you. Uh, but you know, if it asks to mention that the person who was sent to that doesn't believe in that, he believes in reincarnation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It works for Pakistani media and all of this are actually. So uh, this is how they will be projected, and at times they will sweep the entire Hindu community in their uh, prejudice towards India. Yeah. Because they will say, you know, Hindu is Sadish, we are surrounded by them. It's very, very easy to anticipate that for Pakistan. Right. So we read this article, which said that there are certain things that are high risk, considered, uh, you know, sort of high risk for national security. Yeah. And then there are medium risk for national security and low risk for national security. Those things that are high risk for national security, it's almost like the journalists themselves have to become soldiers on the front line. And those that are in the middle, you can become sort of like, I am with the state, but here's my Ajizana uh, Muzari. And with the low risk stuff, you can be completely commercial. Is that really that's an accurate picture? Well, it happens, and uh, at times it's because of uh, you know the, the lack of clarity for some journalists who are not in contact with the agencies and with the PR departments of the agencies. So they can end up saying anything which is not affirmed by those people, and that would you know land them into trouble. I will give you an example of a very prominent actor I won't name him, but he. Did a show uh, on Jamal Khashoggi's death anniversary, who was uh, a Saudi journalist beheaded and brutally murdered by the Saudis in the Turkish embassy. So he commemorated him, his struggle uh, on his death anniversary, and uh, he closed his show. He came out of the studio and he lost his job. Really? Yeah. Immediately? Immediately, he was thrown So he still had no idea that where did it come from. Because we are not working for the Saudi state. So who's doing these who's calling these shots? You know, we were reading an article in which uh, the Saudi Indian you know, sort of media network we read about it, it's massive in Pakistan. Does it have any influence in Pakistan? Well, all the friends in the Pakistani state are not over here. Actually, yeah, because uh, I remember there was uh, this uh, you know this bombardment of news against the Chinese citizens who were married Pakistani women. And the kind of trafficking them back. So Pakistani media kind of put his foot down, put their put his foot down against this. And then there is uh, this instruction coming from the Chinese embassy that the Pakistani media is kind of yielding to us. So that stop. Kind of media has stopped it and it stopped. And since that day, we don't see that kind of news again being made on our Pakistani channel. So all the friends of the Pakistani state, again I'll say, is a no go area. If tomorrow China is an enemy, then they will tell you to speak against China. But for now, we won't. I see. All right. So far, you have almost confirmed everything we've done. Is that done? Yeah. Uh, let's. Uh, uh, but we will not say anything that's terribly controversial. <laughs> <laughs> so let's try and go into some controversial things. Gender, oh. media. What's the situation there? Firstly, I want to know about the participation of women journalists. There are some very five names Asma Shirazi, Dr. Pinesh, and et cetera. Women, Manisha Jahangir, also in the Middle East, for example, several other women that I mentioned. But what is the inside story? Are they really, are the women journalists really equally respected and are they able to participate equally or is it a highly sexist industry? Well, I think if you confirm to the traditional and those are all gender roles, uh, because if you talk about somebody who's just getting into the media industry, uh, if there's a woman in a man, both are expected to do different things. A man or a male journalist is supposed to anchor in the broadcast, and the female journalist is supposed to add the ornamental value to the broadcast, which is very, uh, what, what should I say? Sexist. Yeah, sexist as well. Sad in terms of the fact that they don't expect women to do well at that stage because they, they just assume that uh, she's just there to kind of. Uh, right, that was it. So they will put more stress on how she's looking. Okay, I'll make up say one achai. You're not just saying this. This is really what this happened. Is what happened. Honestly, yes, sir. in the 21st century, yes, sir. despite yes. all the movements we had for women's liberation, uh, it still happened. It did not occur to them, I think. So, uh, at the beginning of the career, this is what they make you do because the expectations are going to be different then. It's not a segregated country. But then there are some very big and good names as well in the industry who kind of broke the shackles of this uh, discrimination and sexism 
I don't outperform to men in the industry as well. Such as? Such as Asma Young, uh, Shirazi, as you said, I would know, say. Even somebody who's very controversial, like Vikita Parvati, she gets badly bashed on social media, abused on social media, but she still sides with the party. So there are a lot of male journalists who side with who side with different parties as well. They are not actually um, used in that matter because just because Vaida is a woman, so they would say all kinds of liberation. What parties. is she wearing today? Yeah. What is the bag next to her? Exactly. So it's very brave and difficult for a woman to you know, kind of assert her political stance in the media. Because that's what they don't want her to do. Or Zara uh, stress you that we see you like a dip case in the comments used to take it, calm the army they do so. So, and then there are some issues with, uh, with harassment as well in the, in the industry, but now I think the trend is changing a bit. So, they put channels to and they are making these anti harassment cells with their organizations and they are taking strict actions against them. But some organizations are still very infamous and very unfriendly towards women and the working environment in prison, in the prison, in the prison, in the You've been quite outspoken in your defense of, let's say, uh, women's movements here. Yeah. I saw some of your. Uh, blog, not so much on the mainstream media, but on social media, you've been very outspoken yeah. in defense of uh, the uh, Orat Mark, for instance. Yeah. And there was that uh, case of the harassment of this TikToker yeah. at, uh, yeah. yes, exactly, at uh, Bangladesh, yeah. Pakistan, so it was a yeah. Minari Pakistan, that's right, Minari Pakistan and so on. I want to understand, but that's on social media. What about coverage of women's issues? Do we have real coverage of women's issues in Pakistan? What's the, what's the situation there? Because we have honor clinics all the time, we have stove burning still going on, we have the uh, labor force participation ratio of women is below 20%. I mean, there are uh, on the gender parity index, we're at the second class or third class or fourth class or something over time. So we are in a really, you know, quite a problem. What, what, you would imagine that in such a situation, women's issues would be covered in some depth. Is that the case? Well, actually, the, the intellectual engine of the media industry, you know, it, it is uh, basing itself on people of 50 plus uh, who belong to the that they are thinking as well. And they are the ones who construct these narratives towards all social phenomena in Pakistan. So, obviously, it can't be expected that they would acknowledge all these atrocities. And they won't say that in the world, the most important thing is that the honor thing is that Pakistan is 25% of the entire globe, so whatever we are doing. So their narratives, I mean, they still keep writing women as sinful as women. You know, the weaker sex, or the delicate one out of the two sexes. This is how they see it. And I always object to this, whenever there is this, uh, you know, on, so I say that this is stereotyping, not thinking out it, mentality. Why don't we change it and you know, grow out of this? But they don't seem to read at all. The first thing is that mummy film Pakistani journalist <laughs> yeah, they are better if I am silent, of course. Really? Yeah. Because the last thing they would spare time on is a book. In fact, I was inserted by a CD producer back in 2018 because I always used to carry a book on the very set. In a break, you give me a book for the book. I was like, yeah, it's not good to say, it's not good to say. If you run down, you can show it, you can tell it, you can tell it, you can tell it, you can tell it. So they kind of ostracize you. If you are too much into books and thinking and narratives and intellectualism, so the last thing they are going to do is to read. And even people who are doing these famous so called shows on, on mainstream media, even they are devoid of any intellectual depth at all. So I found this industry completely intellectual depth. And uh, that's why I mean, you can name anyone if you, if you believe who kind of taught you anything by a television show. Or Something like that. Yes, there is Shahzad Khan Zada, but he keeps a team of 40 people. Really? Yeah, researchers and all that. So it's an entire kind of an industry which is behind working behind him. He's somebody who could be, he could say that he's somebody who's an outlier. But apart from him, all these, you know, uh, 
is unconscious. Uh, words of words. <laughs> because the, the Gallium mentality, which is very hostile towards all identity politics, political movements, and social rights movements, and all that. Social justice, social justice movements as well. Even workers as well, because the other day when I took you on my show, we talked about this aspect of Pakistan. So, even unions are in the debate. I tried to do that, but obviously, you will end up getting snubbed at one point in time. So, you have to acknowledge those red lines which are in the you are supposed to acknowledge and see those red lines because we have to be delusional. We have to love it every day we have a censorship. And only then you can walk this value that's oh my god. Social media. Let's move to uh, you know uh, what we consider to be perhaps a break from all of this mainstream. Okay, this was Muhammad, sorry to say this was really depressing. Was it depressing? Yeah, man. We are right now, we are not really happy with this conversation. I always say I am a big motivator. Yes, we have to focus. Big motivational speaker, where are they making you good about yourself and about your society? Well, obviously, you don't qualify for that. Uh, but, 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 there must be a silver lining somewhere. Social media. I'm sure you think differently about that. Am I right? Yes, because. Uh, it gives you a certain kind of an independence because there is not a lot of clock taken on your head that you run out of time to visa khatam karo so add bhi dalne hai beech mein sara kuch kar so that's where you have the liberty to stretch the conversation and broaden the canvas of thought that you want to project so it gives you a certain kind of an independence but then there's the algorithmic science as well because it makes you fall into an echo chamber as well at times because people who aren't doing your videos you will, you know, kind of keep appearing on the air timeline. So it has its own back, backdrops as well, uh, drawbacks as well. But ultimately, it's way superior to mainstream media because it's free of the advertisement thing. And you will, uh, you will kind of try and see whatever you want to do, can take away, unless you can pick up as well. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, what's his name? Tour. Uh, Asad Ali. Ah, Asad Ali. He's a brilliant journalist, by the way. Really? Yeah, I follow him. But uh, I mean, okay, that's as far as what you can do on social media. Okay, and I'm sure you're right. I mean, I get the history of philosophy and all kinds of other silly stuff on social media. But as far as the social media landscape itself is concerned, you have the option that you can do different things. But as, or joke in mainstream media. But as far as the landscape itself is concerned with respect to Pakistani social media, what is that like in your view? Well, it's like. 90% of that is dominated by the far right and the right wing. Okay. Because uh, they have the audiences in Connecticut and Mass numbers. Why? Well, that's because people are stupid and they can't. I see. I did not consider that option at all. <laughs> because if, uh, if, you, if you talk about simpler things, it is more simple. And if you go into complexity, then you squeeze your audience with your own hands. So you are committing a suicide of social media. Because then the focus group is squeezed. You know, very few people. For instance, if you are delivering a lecture on direct link, how many people can you expect that could sustain a thing like that for one hour? Three? Yeah. <laughs> so, but if you're talking about, let's say, cricket or uh, uh, what is Myra Khan wearing tonight on the show mm -hmm. or anything like that, what Sakhlaric has recently said about somebody. Mm -hmm. So, it has a huge audience. So, the proportion is, by the way, is favoring the right. So that's why even I had this challenge initially that I'm saying things which are very unpopular. So I have to break into that. So that was challenging because then comes the flag that you talked about. You know, this uh, torrent of abuse on the comment section is good. So we as you know, my government, you So you have to be mentally very tough to sustain this kind of uh, criticism and abuse of conflict as well because even on Twitter, we talk about. It's very, very toxic. Yeah, it's, yeah. Very, it's naturally very toxic because the most you could say in 250 words is what you Because you can't say something very good in you know, that capacity of the language. It allows you to say very little and uh, you know, keep tweeting all that. So there's a statement pouring out of all directions if you see anything. And yeah. you get the center of this, uh, you know, this 
warfare. So you have to be mentally very tough. Even, even somebody who is a clinical psychologist like Dr. Peterson, you know, he did uh, delve into depression and deactivated the spirit of like people. Yes, sir. Yeah, so he could do that. Well, was that I was wondering if you could uh, offer us your opinion about the different kinds of social media. Twitter, you already covered. It's a form for idiots. <laughs> no wonder Donald Trump is so successful on it. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think there is something to be said about the fact that Twitter is so concise that it's easier to insult a person than to give an argument. Yeah. And in any case, it's easier to insult a person than to give an argument because argument takes more cognitive power and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have Facebook, which is really good for sharing camps. <laughs> and we have YouTube, which is great for uh, videos, etc. You use these two mediums quite frequently. But now we are seeing that all these three media media are being, you know, bypassed and rapidly taken over by. That's right, by TikTok. Well, I think I'm, I'm sure you're not a fan of TikTok. I, I know you're not a fan of TikTok. But TikTok seems to me to be quite unique in the sense that I look at it in the class. Politics sense that Twitter is for the elite, for us folks. Right? Then there's Facebook for the middle class. I don't know where YouTube fits exactly, it can help you with that. But TikTok seems to be for the working masses of the world. Tell me about these different media and how you view them. TikTok certainly has provided the, the lower classes an opportunity to kind of fund their money and enter into their bank, bank that you know, making the top dollar. Because the reach is crazy. You know? Go into millions, these TikTokers, three, four, I don't know whether, I don't remember their names, but they are following in Pakistan like 12 million, 13 million. Wow. wow. And they are endorsing brands which is, you know, offering them money which is not being offered to the mainstream celebrities of Pakistan. That's very important. So, what you're saying is that if I'm a TikToker and I have 10 million followers, yeah. I can talk to Marie's friends and yeah. tell them that I will drink this on TikTok in exchange for. You would have to talk to them in TikTok. Oh, okay. Yeah. I will get some TikTok followers. <laughs> because that has a huge kind of engagement. And uh, the thing is that it's very concise as well. Now I think they have uh, expanded their duration of the video, I guess. But prior it was like one minute or something, I'm not sure. What is it now? I think it's like two and a half minutes. Still not sure about it, but they expanded it. So that's, that, that is what which is making it very easy to consume by anybody. Because it, it's relevant to almost all the entire population of this country. Like anybody who's using There are people in, like uh, somebody in the uh, India, Khanna, or you know, the South Punjab areas, last year used TikTok in Dasi, who got very famous. You know, they used to work in their villages as laborers or whatever. And they used to make these funny TikTok videos. The reach was that, or uh, within 30 seconds, you'll have to do something very simple. The world is easy to consume. So it's very people friendly now. There are no complex. But you don't like it. What yes. is the criticism? The criticism is that it's disastrous to your attention spans. You become a swipe swipe person. And the max you could sustain a video of all of the art is like 30 seconds or so. So the I think the biggest oppression that you could inflict on a person is to uh, snatch their critical faculties from them. Because then you would ask for an angle. Because the only thing which differentiates us with an unconscious angle is the consciousness. So consciousness has the prefrontal cortex, you know, the particularization of the critical faculties. And if you're not critical anymore, so you hardly need somebody to make the person. So these very concise and very uh, squeezed attention sparing, this these trends are you know making you lose all of your attention to critical faculties as well. So that's why we see the rise of uh, this TikTok generation of which uh, somebody who's walking. I have a lot of time to go to the gym, I have a million views on it. I have an influencer who has done something so important for the society. Even the Prime Minister and the Governor called me to talk to the Governor House. They are the only ones who did it. In the last year, they are the only ones who did it. I did not do that. Yeah, so they are seeking for the help of the Governor's mom to influence and educate us. You think you could give me a list of influential TikTokers? Maybe I'll invite yeah. like them for coffee or something. Yeah, the next time you have them here. Or next time I'll have to have them for a talk here. Maybe they won't do a talk, but they might do the work. That's the best thing. YouTube, I, I'd say, is the, the most uh, educated part of all of these kind of platforms. 
because it has that uh, kind of huge spectrum of Sari Kunya Sibosh and Hindu Dabhuri Dabhuri. And there is this limitless amount of footage that you can view and see and watch. So all these lectures, let's say this lecture right here, I mean it's available to all of you to the Ambarare admission here, but then again it's available to the entire mass of people who want to see this. So this availability, you are you know, footage friendly medium and it's available to Facebook, uh, on the contrary, has been revolutionary. Uh, revolutionary so, if we look at the context of it, so all the protests that are on Facebook, then it's going to be more viewing. So a censorship is being introduced to Facebook now. Even I have been banned like four or five times on Facebook. Really? Yeah. Why? Because I bashed TLP. Oh, really? Yeah. So the other person was siding with Khalid with me. By the way, the same thing happened to me. I uh, shared a book by the great Muslim philosopher Al Ghazali. With the help. People don't know, but Al Ghazali was very much in favor of music. And he wrote this book, Kitab al Musiki, or something it's called, called uh, which, is, which argues that Musiki is not anti Islam. So I shared the book, and uh, sadly, Facebook thought that I was talking about a dangerous individual. <laughs> so bad. Bad. Because the algorithm is not sensitive enough to know yeah. if I have written DLP in the caption, so I'm not kind of favoring that. Yeah. 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 The best thing on Facebook is that there is this contestation and debate going on. Because on YouTube, you don't have a profile to share it and then talk about it. But on Facebook, you can share somebody's video with a caption. So the parts are all the time in engagement with each other. So that's the, the attractive part of these two platforms. Some say dumb gaya to the YouTube party. Uske the second level the gaya on the Facebook party, or some sort of gaya on the Twitter party. So that gives you an idea of the level of toxicity, or maybe a smile of popularity. Who knows? Okay. So finally, to conclude, Muzaffar, uh, going forward, there are some uh, students here who. Uh, would like to maybe make careers in journalism, maybe if you give them some advice on the do's and don'ts of a career in journalism. What are they? First of all, don't get into the industry. Okay. <laughs> the don't is just don't. <laughs> just say no. Yeah. Well, it depends on how, how you see yourself as a person. Have you self-actualized or not? Because the glamour is altogether attached with anchoring and broadcast journalism. Because all of us kind of end up thinking that if you are anchor, then you are not going to be able to do it. Because you are on the screen and people can see you and you have an identification and a face is there. So I think if we kind of self actualize and we see that there are our talents lying there, actually, they won't go out there. Not in fact, they are very much like that. They are not going to be anchor. And it happens to a lot of people, they are going to be more for what they are going to be asking. And they are going to be asking a class or a great time. Every mass com student wants to be an anchor. Everybody does. No matter how they will do this, what kind of things they are. Some get there, they are anchor. What are the other options then? Well, other other options are there, but I think the most attractive of the options for now is freelance journalism. Because if you are not an admission, they can't come. The opportunities won't come because it's a time industry. The state has kind of facilitated its death recently. In the sense that पहले एक तो business model ही खराब है इसमें शुरू से क्योंकि आपने hire the scheme तो सारी एक तो over hire इस और एक phone था उस टाइम की industry तो अगर सत्तर channel लग गए हैं all seventy of them are showing the one one and the same thing every other day so there is no you know the value is not being there there is no novelty attached to the fact that and the growth model is not there at all social media has smashed almost eighty percent of the average Really? Yeah, from the industry. I didn't know that. Because if I can manage the brand page now, let's say the Pani ki bolu page. So I know that the DRPs on the mainstream TV is like the best in the news which we could strike is like 0.3, 0.9. So, but if you have a lot of drama in the industry, you can see how many TV is dropping here in 8, 9 or 3. 0.3 versus 8 or 9. So these are the odds. So news channels are basically in a dying industry. So that's why if you're planning your future there, you can get into a big trouble unless you're very competitive and you can stay there and survive and all that. So that's so what you're facing is a big big problem. Even the politicians are looking at So this is what we, you know, we are supposed to kind of uh, uh, 
evaluate the opportunity as well. कि वो कितना realistic हो कि आप social media पे opportunities हैं कि नहीं। और social media जो है वो वैसे ही सब छेद रहा है आपसे। So if you want to become your own boss, I would say that become a freelancer. If you are making videos or you are writing for someone on a paper or whatever it is, I think that is social media. But in the mainstream media, there are very few options. On that lovely, optimistic, motivating note, uh, do I mean a lot of